Welcome to The Dentist Report. I'm Dennis Acheson. Oftentimes in the media, we get stories about quality of life. Uh, we're dominated by economic issues, political issues, healthcare issues. And when it comes to education, we often hear from people in administration or professors, but we often don't get to hear from students or people who've recently graduated because the stories get dominated with conflict rather than vision and heart and desire to live in New Brunswick. Today's guests are recent graduates from the university system here in the province, and we want to explore with them how they see the province, what speaks to them, and where they'd like to see this province go. We're really pleased to have Jamie Lee Hahn and Robert McLaughlin here as our guests today because we're going to talk about what it's like to go to university, graduate, and then what comes afterward. So Jamie Lee and Robert, thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. And thanks for your patience as we get ready to get rolling and get doing things. So I thought maybe to start, and you can relax like it's not that formal on TV. You <laughs> Put know? my hands up. It's not that <laughs> stiff, yeah. The, um, I wanted you to start with what was it like, can you go back to graduating high school? And what were you were imagining in that window of time and what was to come? Can you, can you story tell like, oh, I graduated high school and this is what I thought would happen? I was always, you know, uh, I wouldn't say pushed into a degree, but you know, there was a lot of pressure to go get a degree. You know, that's kind of like where, uh, what you do when you graduate high school yeah. and you go on and you get a job, right? Yeah. And uh, I guess we'll get into, maybe that's not exactly what happens nowadays, but uh, that was definitely my experience. For sure. So you're at which high school did you go to? Uh, Harvey High School. All right. And you graduated how long ago? Oh, geez. Uh, Ten years, I would say. And no gray hair yet. No gray hair. <laughs> well, maybe a few. <laughs> That's not nice. That's why I keep it short, right? <laughs> Fun. So ten years ago, Harvey High School, expectations were graduate, go to university. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then a job. Yeah. And did it have to be a university within the province, or was there other options? Or, like, what's that world like at that time? You know, I, I felt that way, but I don't know if there's a lot of pressure to... to uh, stay here, but um, I did feel a little uh, family pressure to stay in the area and sort of thing. A lot of my family is here. It's where I, I feel comfortable. It's where I feel home. Yeah. So definitely there was the, the option to go to school so close to where I was raised and where I grew up and where I went to high school was almost a, a bonus to me. Yeah. So it was highly valued. Yes, it was something exactly. to do. Degrees yeah. in what? Uh, engineering. Engineering. Yeah, civil engineering. So a few of the world's right and wrong. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very black. Sorry. Very white. Uh, that's fun. Jamie? Um, I, guess, I don't know. My experience was a bit different. When I graduated high school, I knew I wanted to go to university because not so much of my parents said I had to go, but more so that all of my friends were going and I wanted to go. Um, I didn't feel any pressure to stay in Nova Scotia, which is where I'm from. So I actually came to New Brunswick to go to school because I wanted to meet new people and I wanted to get those new experiences. Hmm. But... Um, yeah, it changed after I left high school because, you know, in high school, I want to be a, a chemist. And that's what I'm going to school for. And I get to school and I was like, I don't want to be a chemist <laughs> anymore because it's a lot harder than I thought it would be. But, um, yeah. yeah, so that was my experience. I was just excited to go because socially that's what everybody was doing more so than my parents telling me, you must, you must go. Because each of me and my brothers all did different things. So you guys make a nice contrast, which I wasn't aware of. You had a career path in mind, graduate Definitely. high school, take yeah. an engineering, engineering degree, stuff happens after. Yeah, I filled out a form and everything. You know, what do you want to be when you, when you graduate high school? Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Yeah. University, civil engineer. Yeah. And you were exploring. It's like, let's yeah. go see what happens. Yeah, and I mean, I was in university, and I, three years in, changed my major because I wanted to do something else then, mm -hmm. and then graduated, and I changed my major again because... I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> when I grew yeah. up. So yeah. there's that window of time, 18, 19, till whenever. Some people it's 50, mm -hmm. when they're muddling through what they're going to be or what's going to fall into place for them. If you don't mind, let's talk about the money element a little bit at the front end because you definitely hear about it more at the back end, which mm -hmm. is what we'll get to. So at the time, financial resources are tough. Um, did you guys have part-time jobs or summer jobs or something, and did it help or? Let me. Doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, myself, like I, I don't have debt now, I guess. And I, at the time, I didn't have a lot of financial pressure to go, or for university, I had uh, uh, trust funds and that sort of thing. So, okay. you know, I didn't need to work. I, I did in the summers and that sort of thing to help pay for 
my education, but uh, I was lucky in that regard. Yeah. Quite a contrast, I'm sure, too. Yeah. Big contrast. <laughs> um, I've been working since the day that I was allowed to work 16. I got my first job and I stayed there for four years, hmm. or yeah, until I graduated high school. And then I've been working every summer during university. I worked in the athletic center. When I went to college, I worked three jobs while going full time to school um, just to kind of help help it along a little bit, but mm. all of my funding for university has come from student loans and that little bit of money that my parents were able to give me and then the money I made was money that I had to spend mm. on food or whatever it was. Mm. So I had to work to go to school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, because it's like that nowadays. It's changed a fair amount. Earlier at lunch when we were gabbing, um, there was a conversation about uh, what school was like in the 70s and what tuition mm -hmm. was and yes. stuff. And that's a major theme, a the squirrel moment to a different topic, but it relates. Quebec student protest two summers ago, um, that was the value system. Uh, education was supposed to be affordable and accessible. Mm -hmm. It's very much ingrained in the culture of Quebec and the rest of Canada still trying to figure out what that's about. And the students were rightfully um, standing up for something they cared about. And you guys have a, a different pattern for how you got there. Mm. So talk about school itself. You know, so you're in university, what's like, was it party hard the whole time? <laughs> it can be, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, you know, because people have their stereotypes, and this is a, or expectations or myths or whatever, but this is a rare opportunity to hear from people who've gone through the system, mm -hmm. recent past, so the memory's fresh, but what it was like to live through that. For me, uh, I know uh, you talked about working through a uh, part of university. Mm -hmm. For me, uh, in my degree anyway, I. I felt like I had no time other than <laughs> university, and uh, that little bit you had was late into the evening when, yeah, maybe you had a bit of party hiding and stuff like that. But so, so engineering, civil engineering. Yeah. So is it intense in terms of workload? Uh, in, in terms of workload, I would definitely say it was up there, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, you definitely have your classes, and then you have labs and stuff like that, and, mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, all night long, I, a lot of nights, you know, I would be doing homework and catching up and doing readings and that sort of thing, just to stay on top of it. Yeah. And in another era, there was a movie called Animal House that kind of <laughs> set the tone for what university <laughs> associates are like. And see, that's what I was hoping for. <laughs> yeah. So no Animal House no. in your world. Oh, well, that's interesting because it almost dampens where I think Jamie's going to go. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Um, for me, I guess I lived first, my first two years in residence, and when you're in, in residence, there's no way to get away from the Animal House or the, the partying. Um, and I think that for me, anyways, I look back at my university career and I don't remember everything I learned, but I remember all the social things that happened. And in my fourth year, I was specifically like, I'm not missing out on any opportunities that happen. Like, if I get a B instead of an A on my <laughs> test, I'm like, that's fine. Hmm. So I just didn't, I didn't miss out on any of those social opportunities. So being in university, I found that it, it built me better as a person for society, more so than it built me better for the workforce because you know you're memorizing you're learning I studied a lot hmm. because you have to hmm. but I always made time for other things as well do you guys remember um, as you selected which university you were going to go to and, and identify it when you start, do you remember the kind of pitch you got from the university the way they encourage you to come to their school instead of another school remember that Jamie you want to give that sure um, well, I knew that I wanted to go to a school that not a lot of people from my town, my high school, were going to. So I started to look at places outside. But I went to Mount Allison University, and they have such an outstanding reputation. And I knew that if I went there, that I would be respected as a graduate of Mount Allison University, as opposed to some, I won't, I won't name the universities, but some universities who I know don't have that reputation. So for me, Mount A kind of, that was their pitch. Like we're, we're top notch. We're number one. We have so the reputation high of the school gives you other doors after you're done. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in your world, well, for me, um, the University of New Brunswick definitely has a, um, a very good reputation in terms of their engineering program. So for me, it was almost a no-brainer. What with yeah. my uh, already living here and that sort of thing. So yeah. I didn't really need much of a pitch. I did definitely go hear from them what they wanted to tell me why I should go there but mm. I had already kind of made up my mind. Mm. Mm. In general terms most universities recruit hard and heavy trying mm. to keep their freshman classes up. Um, sometimes it has to do with the university finances, other times it has to do with a potential career path. So did they, 
Was it your expectation when you went into university, knowing you're going in for a life experience, two different ones by the yeah. sounds of it, mm. that, um, that there was something that would come after all of this, time, effort, dollars, and stuff? So did the university ever map out, um, and I'm not trying to nail anything, I'm just trying to know what your experience was like. So you're 18, you're signing on to go to a school, and you've got four or five years in front of you, and there's a financial element. But afterward, other things are supposed to happen. So hmm. was it always a clear path to a job? Was it a clear path to a career? What, what was your expectation as you got to the fourth year of school or fifth year of school? And well, there's, there's definitely an expectation that, you know, once you, like I say, when, when I, I got into university, there was that sort of, of you, you go to university and then you, you've got a job, you know, you've, you've made a career for yourself. And uh, that wasn't my experience when I got out. It took me a while to find my first job and then my jobs after that, you know, so it's. Uh, Can you tell us what they were? Like, oh yes. Well, where did you? Where, like, where did you go? Where did it land? Uh, so you know, I I, I uh, was a little while, and I found my first job. I worked for like a, a trust manufacturer, like a, a designer as a designer, and um, I did that for quite a few years. And then I I uh, took a job with the government because uh, with the Department of Transportation, just because, well. You know, that was in itself almost a promise of, hey, you can't fail working for the New Brunswick government, right? Yeah. And so that was my experience. You weren't reading the newspapers, No, were see? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> nope. No, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So then it came to bite you recently that uh, the way they're always trying to downsize government and you yeah. would have been a junior hire or a be beginner mm -hmm. hire and all that and, stuff. And I mean, uh, they were downsizing and they were, and uh, sort of people don't always move out of, of the... Well, the retirees, exactly. and, you know, smaller workforce by attrition, we have free people to yeah. retire, but it doesn't fit your time yeah. frame. They could be another five years and you need something. Exactly. And, and I mean, there's a lot of people coming out of school and, you know, not a lot of jobs opening up. That's another point, too. I, maybe we should come back to that after sure. Jamie. So what was your fourth year? You're graduating. Like, what's next? You know? um, well, like they tell us, you graduate, you get a job and that's what it is. But then when I was in fourth year, psychology major, I graduated with my psych and bio degree and then you get into the workforce and you realize that nobody is going to hire you with a bachelor's degree in psychology. Hmm. What the heck are you going to do with that? So then I realized I had to specialize so I decided to go back to school to specialize in rec therapy and once again I'm like I'm going to graduate and I'm going to get a job and then you graduate and you realize well there's there's still no <laughs> there's still no jobs in that specific field. So hmm. I assumed as a fourth year grad that I could graduate and get a job and start working but I had to get more education and then even after that I applied to 200 jobs until 200 jobs in four months and then I finally got one um, I worked for the Nova Scotia Community College which was an amazing starting job like I was very very lucky to get that I had full health benefits pension everything did that matter to you at your age did you you pay attention no. to that and that is actually something that kind of in the end made me want to leave that job because I was paying so much in to my pension, I was paying so much into my benefits that my take home pay wasn't enough to cover my well, cost of living. Loans. Where my student loan is, it's really high. So, yeah. um, but I was still lucky to be able to get that job, but um, it took over 200 applications and four months of waiting. And that six years of school didn't mean anything. <laughs> Fascinating, eh? yeah. So you had an expect. It wasn't necessarily a promise by the university, but there was an expectation there. Mm -hmm. Did the university provide any kind of a support network for that transition from when you leave school to where um, you land a job? I know there's co-op programs different places. Mm -hmm. um, New Brunswick Community College prides itself on job placement after you graduate. Those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, the university level, do they do any of that stuff? For I think for it depends on what you're in. If you're in, say, nursing, then absolutely they do. But if you're in any, a lot of the other things, definitely not. But I got, I was lucky enough to experience university and college. University didn't give me that training. I went to college and I got so much experience. I had two years worth of work experience while being in school just because it was part of my curriculum. Hmm. So that offered me something more than university could, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of people don't value college as much as they do university, but they should because you're getting that practical work experience that mm -hmm. is going to help you get a job. Yeah, that whole issue of what to value and not to value is a whole new discussion or narrative that needs to unfold because we still have the traditional approach to graduate high school, go to university, and then there's yeah. employment after. The employment landscape has changed so much 
since the mid-80s, actually, mm -hmm. that um, there no longer is a nice straight line between them. Um, there was something that you had said I wanted to tie it back to Robert, and it was about uh, engineering, you would think would have an internship type program where you get that on-the-job experience. Did you go through that? No, and I mean, yeah, you, there are definitely uh, co-op uh, opportunities available and that sort of thing for when you graduate or d during your, your education, but you know, those spots are limited. They're not available to everyone, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and I never had the opportunity to get through into any of those. You know? okay. Once I was done university, I was on my own to find my own job. Which you know is what I expected, but I didn't expect there to be uh, the limitations of availability and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, the practical side of it. You yeah, know, um, where you're doing hands-on in the workplace and applying the stuff that you've just learned. Mm -hmm. Funny, because I would think engineering would apply itself more directly yeah. to that kind of opportunity than you know recreational therapy, which is just as valued, but it's a different doorway. Mm. In the longer tradition, too, in, in civil engineering, yeah. it's been around for a long time. We're going to need it a lot more as infrastructure crumbles and, and <laughs> yeah. that's a whole other story. So some of this all started, or the idea for this interview um, with you guys started because Jamie did a post on her Facebook a while ago, and she had this great question, and it spawned like umpteen responses to it. And the question was, does anyone else wonder why they even bothered co going to university? <laughs> because you guys, you're what, four years out of it now? Three or four years out? Yeah. Five years out? Yeah, five, six, yeah. About and three. You're two or three two years three, out. Yeah. So you've got some more life experience under your belt, a couple of the knocks in that trying to work world mm -hmm. um, from the school style of life. Because in a way, you know, you're in school all the time and it, it stops. You're 22 or 23 and yeah. that school culture goes away and mm -hmm. you slide into another culture. We often don't even talk about what that other culture is like. Yeah. You're just thrown in and yeah. good luck. So well, why don't you play around with that, you know, the, do you feel not sad or depressed because things are cool? Like you've got an education and, and there's yeah. good things going on, but there is that question that surfaced your question: like, did, why did we bother with this? Mm -hmm. You want to play with that Be because that then spawns what are you going to do in your thirties? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, for me, I asked that question because I had a few conversations with a different, a, a few different friends, and they were they're currently working in a field not even in a field, they're working so at Walmart, at PetSmart, and they have four year bachelor degree education and it's like, why, why did I do this when I can't even get a job and I'm working like a part-time job or I'm working minimum wage with these huge student loans. Yeah. And it's just, it's almost like when you wanna go get a job in your field, they either require you to have five plus years experience or minimum now, the minimum now is a master's degree for a lot of things. Mm. So not only do you have this bachelor's degree, you just don't know what to do with it. So, and for that job I got at NSCC, I didn't need a bachelor's degree for that. I just needed a college, um, a college diploma. Mm. So I could have saved myself, if I wanted to stay at that job, I could have saved myself four years and $40,000. Um, but yeah, so that's why I asked the question. And as like you could see from the comments, a lot of people are right there with me. So. I think that our generation and people who have graduated when we graduated are all kind of feeling that right now because, I mean, I, I went to school for psychology because I wanted to work in the psychology field and- Mental health field? Exactly, mm. and I'm just, you can't do it with a bachelor's degree, mm. unfortunately. Mm. <laughs> And your experience with, was looking back and go, was it worth it? Or <laughs> was it worth any, it? Was it? You know, why did we bother doing it that way? Yeah, and, and see, I think it was worth it for me to do, to do what I did. But um, like how you say, maybe it wasn't worth it to do the same way. Like maybe, uh, you know, where I was before I went to university, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to be. You know, I was pushed in a certain way or, you know, felt pushed in a certain way. But, uh, you know, uh, having a broader education would be like the only difference I maybe would have made to myself like less specific. Yeah. yeah. And in the back of my head I can hear some adults of my age kind of you guys well you made your choices like yeah. and, and and so it's good and again it's all good. I mean you both have gotten degrees and you're through a system and there's a whole experience that that happens that you described earlier. But at the same time your 18 or 19 year old selves probably would have appreciated <laughs> knowing what the 25 <laughs> or 29 year old self knows now. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you get an 18 year old to focus on that? Because universities are very traditional in their recruiting methods. They want to keep their numbers up. 
and it doesn't necessarily tie to job opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which ties to another discussion to slide into. Do you think there's a direct relation between your university degree and getting a job? Because it's an old, old debate that post-secondary education, liberal arts degree is about well-rounded experience, people that can read and write and do math and those sorts of things compared to learning a technical trade and you're doing that specifically for the job market. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know for me, like I've worked side by side with people and I have no problem with this that are maybe just not as, and don't have the same education as me, you know, and uh, they, pe those people could argue maybe I have a higher ceiling of advancement or that sort of thing, but to me, I mean, they clearly got to where I was or have been without the same education. Right. Yeah? And, and it's not a problem, but it's a, uh, Hey, I could have done that. Yeah. yeah. So, it's, yeah. Go ahead, Jamie. No, I was just thinking it, it's true though because, for example, um, my mom works for a bank. She didn't have to go to university to do that. She took her courses, and that was that. And then now, for a lot of those jobs that the people who are working there now, they didn't have to go through university to get them, and now you have to go through university just to get the opening position in that job, mm -hmm. um, where you didn't need to years ago. Hmm. So it's just, it's all very different now. And I, I don't see it as a clear path from university to work anymore because now I realize you need university, then you need experience, hmm. then you can work. Hmm. So if you guys had a chance to speak to a high school graduating class <laughs> about the experience of going through all of this, <laughs> uh, what would be two key messages that you would give them? Because it, it's complex and it's mixed and everybody chooses their way, but you've been through it now and it's much more important to hear from you guys than 50-year-olds or 40-year-olds who have another experience at school? Um, I don't know. If I were to talk to high school students, I, I personally, even though I am in debt right now from school, I would still do it all over again because that's good life experience, like being at university and meeting all those people, making those connections. So I would say you, you should still do it, but just know that when you graduate, don't expect for a job to be handed to you. Like, try to work while you're at school and try to volunteer while you're at school and develop that experience while you're there and it will help you advance and get a job faster. Because hmm. I know I wouldn't have gotten the jobs that I've gotten today if it hadn't been for the volunteer experience that I've done. And I think a lot of students right now don't realize that and they don't put value into those kind of experiences. Hmm. They don't realize that they could put that on their resume and that's why sometimes it takes longer for people to get jobs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good point. Robert, thoughts on that? You summed it up really well. Can I? Yeah. <laughs> so you're back at Harvey High School. And say I'm Robert McLaughlin. I graduated in 2000 and whatever. Yep. And uh, I'm here to give you a message. <laughs> Don't go to school. No. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think I tell, still tell myself to, to, to go and do it. And, you know, I, I'd want myself to do how I did and learn how I did, I guess. <laughs> I wouldn't want to change it. But uh, right. if I could tell it to somebody else, I... Everyone's got to find their own, own way, and, and I, I guess I could share my experience as I am right now, and that's all I could really do. Yeah. Was well, there something you would have uh, wanted the university to do better for you, either when you arrived there or when you left there? Suggestions for them? You know, here's your suggestion box when you leave the restaurant. Hey, the service is great, but you could have, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, I think more honesty about what real life is actually like. <laughs> well, you, there's a trick yeah. question. <laughs> well, because you get trapped, and I don't, it might not be like this in all universities, but where Mount A was such a small school, we were in this little bubble, and everything was just peachy keen, and we were getting these great degrees, and we're gonna go into the world, but none of the professors ever once told us that there's, there's more, you have to do more, and you have to do all of these things, so I just would have liked people to have been upfront with me and knowing that hmm. um, there are different obstacles that you have to go through. It's not just university degree job because that's, I was led to believe that that's what it was. Yeah. And being a naive teenager, you yeah. just believe it because you're like, oh, okay. Well, that's, easy. yeah, that's one of those transition points about older people tend to have authority or they act like they have authority and it isn't necessarily so as you grow up and start to go, oh, wait a second, that made no sense what they <laughs> told me three mm -hmm. years ago. You know? Your version of that? What could the school have done better? Or do you have suggestions for them? Well, uh, y you know, I look at university as, as uh, they, they taught me how to learn. You know, uh, I knew how to learn before, but they taught me how to learn yeah, in, in life, you know? Yeah. And um, so I think they do that really well, but I was never really informed very well 
uh, about how what they were teaching us doesn't always necessarily transition into it. You know, you got to learn to take that as life experience and, and just learn how to learn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that wasn't really explained to me. And I, I sort of only picked that up after mm -hmm. I graduated that maybe I should spend more time thinking about just taking all the general lessons as opposed to like, you know, reading exactly out of the textbook sort of stuff. Interesting. This makes me want to play with uh, how much information is enough and how much is too much. Because <laughs> you described, yep. you know, what your day was like. So yep. whew, information overload. Totally. Oh, and where's the fun? Yep. You know, what you can't talk about on air. So yep. that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas yours was more of a mix. But there's still a, how do you get it across to a 19-year-old? Um, there's stuff going on right now about pensions. And you can't get anybody except for those where the pension's going to affect them 55 mm -hmm. or older. They're paying attention now. But the roots of that happen 25 or 30. Yeah. But it's really hard to get a 25 or 30-year-old to pay attention to something that'll affect them 30 years down the road. Or why they should be part of this larger discussion going on in the province right now on pension reform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So similarly, you're in university or you're 18 and you've got somebody from recruiting from the school talking at you. And how do you catch what's the key piece and what's the one you don't want to count because that doesn't make sense? You know? <laughs> how, like, how do you get it across to those guys? Do you change the platform? Do you do it through social media and have more chat discussions, access to people like you doing shows like this? Because like, there's people following you with the same expectation. Yeah. Um, it's a good question because I, I don't really know because sometimes I remember when I was 19 and going to school, <laughs> and if somebody would have been like, oh, you're, you're, you're going to be in debt when you graduate, I was like, yeah. okay, I'll worry about that when the time comes. Yeah. So you just don't realize, like, and now looking back, I'm like, ah, come on, Jamie, like, you should have thought about that more. But maybe even in, like, just the front lines, and like I said before, just have the teachers even mention it during a lecture, you know, this is something that's going to help you in your future, This just to put more emphasis on it as opposed to just information 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 but some practical information in there would be nice as well mm. um, I don't know maybe discussions on social media would help too but it's it is hard to get through to people until it actually affects them affects them yeah Very good point. I definitely uh, feel that more of like this you know hearing from people who are not that far outside of, of university um, I would definitely have liked to hear about some stuff like that before I went into it a lot of the testimonials I heard were people who had graduated, been out of university for their entire life, got their career all figured out, and were very successful. And you know, those are the people that they want to show you, I guess. Yeah. And, and to see a, a broader, more truthful, I guess, uh, right. cross-sampling would be nice. Yeah. That's a good point. There's, because you guys are part of a discussion you might not be aware of yet, because <laughs> out there somewhere is ongoing debate about universities cranking out so many graduates Education is the easiest one to pick on. So I think the study was done in Nova Scotia about 10 years ago. Question was, why are universities in Nova Scotia generating so many teachers when there's only so many jobs every year? And the, mm -hmm. that math is very simple. It's basic demographics. We have so many teachers of this age, this age, this age, so many job openings. Um, there's always a bubble or a boom and a bust with population growth. So you know where you're going to have smaller classrooms or less schools because the population declines for a bit and then it gets back. And yet, universities treated their recruitment for um, education programs uh, as a flat line. It was always like 1,100 or 1,200 students every year coming out yeah. of six or seven institutions for 30 or 40 jobs for anyone new. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you guys have had your own experience with that. So it would be really neat to put you guys in a room with policymakers and with district district uh, school district administrators. Yeah. To, to say, well, if we can just even this out a bit, because someone's going to get a sense that they're losing. Like the university will think, we can only recruit 15 candidates this year right. rather than 30 or 40, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So the slide to discussion anyway, so now you're in the workforces, and your university degree and family life has led you to a certain degree. So what's, I mean, you had a job for a while, and then it got bumped because governments are downsizing, and you've had to slide into something different, feeling unrelated. So what's it like in the workforce? It's sort of a broad thing, but it's that culture change from the school culture to this work culture. Don't get to party all the time? <laughs> get to party more? <laughs> See, <laughs> in my experience, the workforce was actually a lot like university life, but, um, you know, less 
less stuff to do after you go home, I guess. <laughs> but it, it, to me, it was all kind of the same. You're still trying to learn. You're still trying to, I mean, at our age, you know, mm -hmm. still trying to, to find your place in that path that you've made from what you've taken in school. Mm -hmm. um, the workforce for me was not like university <laughs> life, I guess, because when real life, adult life comes with a lot more responsibilities. So, you know, I work and then I would come home because now, I don't know why, but for some reason when I was a student, I felt like I had more um, more expendable money. I don't know why that was, yep. but now like in the real life, I'm like, nope, I can't, I can't go out for dinner because I have my student loan payment coming out <laughs> or I have my car payment coming out, I have my insurance coming out. And that, those are things that I never had to worry about when I was a student. And now it's just, I guess it's kind of like a reality check when you get that first job and then your rent is coming out and your all these bills are coming out so isn't it interesting it's considered a reality check because mm -hmm. for me I, like it's all reality you've yeah. been great with yeah. saying no no this counts this is a learning yep. experience so it's just that shift um to speak on behalf of my generation which is inappropriate for me to do but um we haven't left a good path for you guys for the next generation come by the job opportunities aren't the same when i was a you know your guys age um, we haven't left a job market, if you want to call it that, or fun with doing something you're passionate about, which is much more interesting. <laughs> got a job and got to pay my bills, right. quality of life, you know? So it, it's, you ever, um, in that dialogue that is the conversation between the generations, do you ever um, begrudge them that, well, or do you ever want to throw it back at them? It's like, well, look at the way you guys had it. Tuition was like 3,000, not seven or 8,000. <laughs> Do you ever want to throw it back at them a little bit? Say, how come you didn't make it a bit better? Because my generation thinks you guys are privileged. They see the thumb twitch and, and, and doing this stuff all the time and everything's easy. And I think it's the opposite. It's anything but easy. I wouldn't want to throw it back at you or anyone <laughs> of your age group. But because uh, things were definitely different, you know, and, yeah. and, and the world's changing fast. And, and I think it's just a different world than, than it was before. And, you know, we got to find our own path because we can definitely learn from uh, the people who have come before us, but you know, it, it's a new changing world that we're living in now, so mm -hmm. we got to do it ourselves. Ah, we got to do it ourselves. Good theme to pick up. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Your thoughts? Um, I don't necessarily throw it back unless, I mean, there have been times when I've had older relatives or what, <laughs> what it may be um, say, well, I mean, you're not trying hard enough to find a job. You should have a job by now. It's like, uh, excuse me, I've been applying to like 200 jobs. There's just <laughs> nothing. I mean, there are jobs available, but who are they going to pick? Somebody who just graduated or somebody who's coming in at them with like five, ten years experience? Yeah. I'm always going to get overpassed by those people, which is why, like, once again, I feel really lucky even for the job I have now because they said it in the job description that we're looking for somebody who has graduated within the last four years. And I'm just like, thank you, because that, <laughs> that helps us out so yeah. much when they have those opportunities available for people. Yeah. Um, and it's not that we're not trying, and it's not that we're privileged, because I definitely, you know, sure, privileged with technology or whatever it may be, but it's not like I ever had things just handed to me, like I still have to work for them. So it's just, uh, it's a different, like, it's a different mindset. And I don't, I don't want to throw things back at other people, but if somebody were to say to me, you're not trying, then I'm going to be like, <laughs> too trying. <laughs> yeah. I'm always trying. It's a fascinating. The expectations between the generations. Mm. Um, there's going to be a provincial election this year in September. Um, one of the key themes that run through every election is job growth and job creation. Do you guys have any thoughts or feelings what, what would work? Because tied to that would be um, how do we keep young people stay in the province? How do we make it a fun place for them to live? How do we give them a future here? Um, so for you guys, like, what would be an, what would be a great province to live in, like, wh and what would the job be, and how does it get created if you can go there? It's hmm, a good question. Um, I think. See, I love the East Coast. I I lived in Ontario, and there's always things going on there, and it's fun. But I'm always driven home, and I love being in the East Coast. But there there's always that lack of things that are going on and sometimes it can just kind of feel dull. So if you want younger people to come back, you have to give them something to do. You have to open up those job opportunities and maybe those things that you're planning to do are opening up job opportunities, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I've, I know a lot of my friends who have moved away and they're like, no, we don't want to come back because there's nothing going on. Mm -hmm. It's just boring there. So mm -hmm. more things to do. <laughs> 
I think it's less about, well, <laughs> maybe not about, if, if you're trying to bring people back into the, or to stay or, or bring them back, I mean, it, it sounds kind of easy to me, but like I said, I don't have exactly uh, the right idea. Uh, but I mean, our roots are here, you know. I've, uh, me personally, and like you say, you, uh, Maritimes is your home. It, mm -hmm. It's where you want to be. And I mean, if you can appeal to that, uh, I think you can get people to stay. But. Yeah. So I'll flip the question another way because it was pretty broad. So what would keep you here? What would be fun for the next 10 years? Can you describe the ideal next 10 years for you? Finding like that perfect job that appeals to my passions, I guess, and, and it being here. And what? what would that job be? See, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what would you and like to do? Issue, what, what speaks to you in there? Well, uh, you know, I don't know. I feel like I'm still working my way there. Like I'm finding my passion. I'm finding what I want to do. And uh, I guess I don't really have a, an end goal in mind yet. So. All right. You? I have a lot of passions. Yeah. <laughs> I know that my passion is working with persons with mental illness. Um, and working in recreation, which is why rec therapy was so perfect for me. Like what I went to school for, I know that that's, that's what I want to do because I've had that experience in my practicums in my, um, during college. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I want to do. And then I have other passions too, like reading and things like that, that I would love to have my own company and like do all these different things. So I, I do have all these different ideas, but it's hard to get those ideas started when Maybe there isn't that job opportunity or there isn't that little bit of money that you need to start up a company or whatever it may be. So hmm. I have so many things I want to do, but I feel limited sometimes, I guess. Hmm. Um, earlier you had mentioned about um, creating your own, something along that theme about creating your own. Mm -hmm. It might well be that your generation, to generalize a bit, have to do that more than my generation had to mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's all changing so much. Governments are downsizing. Jobs have gone down to Mexico or to China or Taiwan, you know. Um, the way a province used to look doesn't look like this any, anymore. So you get to create it. The exciting part for me is you guys get to create it. But you might not have uh, the places where it's, it's going to create, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. where a bunch of you get together. So the IT community have created their incubator kind of groups and mindset. Be like you guys need a social incubator of some kind where yeah. you can sit there and cook around and do all that. So if you've got an MLA knocking on your door, uh, or a candidate to be an MLA knocking on your door at some point in the months coming, what, what would you tell them to help you guys? Or for the province that you would want to see created? Hmm. Lower education costs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or at least, I, we were talking about this before, um, I know like the province and the government in general when it comes to student loans, yep. they give you too much money sometimes. Like my, mm -hmm. they covered my tuition, and then I got an extra five thousand or so on top of that. And you're a student. What are you going to spend it on? I went shopping and I did all these <laughs> silly things, and now I that that's debt that I have to pay back, and you don't realize. So, if I could talk to any kind of political people, I would just say maybe don't give out as much student mm -hmm. loans. Give for what people need, or at least lower the education costs. I don't know. Education is the only thing right now that matters to me hmm. because it's just it's been in my head for the past six seven years it's hard to pay back those loans hmm. <laughs> so the, um, when you talked about getting that extra chunk of change and spending on stuff did the it'll sound a little crass but did the university create that opportunity for you to spend your money <laughs> of course <laughs> on extra on extra stuff you know yeah, of course or even the way uh, on a practical side even your cost of your books must have been insane uh, i just yeah. imagine the engineering side to be through well, the we roof we were saying uh, yeah. i think it's almost a, a quarter of your year's tuition sometimes in some cases like just for books 200 dollars a book you know and you've got five or six courses and i suppose you use the book one semester right oh yeah i stopped buying my books third year i was like yeah. nope i'm not buying any textbooks i borrowed my friends and i photocopied them at the library the pages i needed and that was that so you've got an MLA at your door you would say lower the cost of tuition which this is an american poster and we can post oh where'd it go and we can post it up it says uh we're tuition free it would cost the federal government less than it spends right now on financial aid programs. And this is an American <laughs> phrase, but have you ever wondered with all the money that gets funneled at universities and all the money through the student loans programs, if, it sounds simple, but if you put that all together, you might be able to afford free public education yeah. for people. Why not? So, you're building nice. for their future, you're building for your country's future. Yeah. yeah. 
So you got an MLA at your door, what would you tell them? Free tuition. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got a bunch of other people going, ah, you got to pay your way, yeah. all, all that stuff. Although, do you think there would be a value in that? In, in, in terms of, do you feel you would be given uh, a special privilege that you wouldn't feel like you had to give back because your post-secondary education was paid for by taxes? I feel like if I were given, if I had free tuition and I became successful after graduation, I would be more willing to give my school a nice big chunk of donation because mm. thank you for my free education. And there's other places that do free tuition, like in Europe or in all these different places where people can go to university for free. So it just, it's, it's hard so to chew when we can't do that and other people can. Sort of like tuition comes after. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So what would, uh, if you got to be the premier <laughs> or in a position of authority, we can affect change at that scale, assuming that that's where change comes from. And that's a whole other debate. Mm -hmm. um, how would you model the province or how would you reshape the province so that um, your age group and your aspirations and the kind of world you want to live in can be created? Because Little New Brunswick's uh, in a unique spot. In some ways, we're so far behind, we can leap ahead whether it's um, you know, dying industries, small population, aging population, but it le leaves us not to have to undo a lot of stuff in order to make a leap forward. Mm -hmm. That is gonna fall with you guys. <laughs> so it's sort of a big question, but, um, but you can speak from the heart about what you would like New Brunswick to be so that you're here for 20 years or 30 years, or you go away for five and come back for the rest there. Yeah. What uh, would it look like? How would you shape it? What would be the priorities for you? I, I want a province and, and the Maritimes in general that retains its its people you know we we're talking people go out west all the time they leave here to to make money and to to use their education and and if it was easy or to, to stay here and and do that that would be what i would like but i mean how would you do that i don't know <laughs> we'll play with that a bit though because the how becomes the hard part but it's the most interesting so would it be do you continue on with forestry um do jobs come from shifting to it sector in the McKenna era, the province tried to go the way of call centers. Yeah. And that was all built on tax breaks, and the company leaves after the tax breaks done. Uh, there needs to be a shift, but I, I, to, to what industries or to what, to what end? I <laughs> yeah. Well, but what would you like to see? Would it be more farming? Do you guys have, you know, food supply? It's a whole other yeah. issue. Mm. See, farming, I, I don't know if that know. would be the answer, but get to build more bridges somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we're already kind of jumping into sectors like IT and that sort of thing and, and consulting and, and, and stuff like that. And I think that's a good way to go. Uh, but without the numbers, like I... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. You're typical, your engineering yep. background's yeah. coming up on me here. <laughs> no, Too no, logic based, Don't give me this blue sky <laughs> stuff, Dennis. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but that's good though, because there's need yeah. for those skill sets. Today, the federal finance minister is going to be rolling out uh, the budget and buried in there is promises about more infrastructure spending, which might tie to you in mm -hmm. bridge design and infrastructure repair because some cities have aging water infrastructure and damage from erosion and temperature or climate change and stuff. Right. So there's hope, but it's in destruction <laughs> yeah. and re <laughs> reconstruction. Maybe that's where the ship needs to be. Yeah, yeah. Your world? Um, Perfect New Brunswick? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't know. See, I think it needs to be like a province-wide discussion because what I want isn't going to make the province better because it, what I want doesn't match up with what everybody else wants. Yeah. But in, in my world, like things that I need to see improved would be more on like the human sector and like the mental health sector where I know that they're starting to do some things now, but other provinces are so far ahead of us. It's in, it's it's crazy because. Yeah, but for instance. Well, for instance, um, well, I could do rec therapy for an instance. Right now, B B C Ontario, that industry is it's growing so quickly because people really see the value in how this therapeutic recreation can help people with uh, different types of mental illness or different types of physical uh, disabilities or whatever it may be. And right now, if you were to type into a career search, the therapeutic recreation um, in New Brunswick, there are no opportunities and you, you go into the hospitals and maybe they have like one rec therapist, mm -hmm. maybe long-term care has one rec therapist where you go to Ontario and there's like a team mm -hmm. um, and there's just not enough emphasis on that, I think, I don't know. 
I, I'm always like focused on the mental health aspect because it's just, it needs more attention than it's been getting, I think. Yep. Yeah. So here's a conundrum for you. Um, and, and it ties to politics because politics ties to where all the decisions are supposed to come together, supposedly in a complementary pattern. Uh, doesn't quite happen, it tends to be a conflict model or my priority is bigger than your priority, which is a mental health agenda thing. So um, um, more and more pressure on governments to be smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And what you just described was making a bigger government. So how would you address, or where's the breakthrough, or can you get your head around, what's the difference, or how do we provide the vision that you want to create for a healthier mental, you know, healthier mental health, there's good language, <laughs> um, province, right? Because um, we downsized those services big time in the 80s for the sake of a deficit. Um, and it's cost us in other ways, so many other places. Similarly, we haven't invested in infrastructure for bridges and water systems. St. John always struggles with its water system, for example. So what, uh, what's the balance? Play with the balance between, because um, you're going to get a lot of it in the media, but we want smaller government, we want less taxes, dot, dot, dot. And that's what people vote for. Mm. But then on the consequences, three years later, you've got mental health issues, you've got all kinds of stuff. Maybe it's a ship. Like, I don't know much about politics, to be honest with you, but maybe it's a shift in where the money is going. Like, do we really need another mall or a strip mall or whatever? Or can you take that money and put it somewhere else? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just a shift of where those dollars are going and where the focus is going. And there's no way that they don't know the issue because it's kind of right in your face, like when you're walking down the street. Good point. Um, so it's just they need to prioritize better for the people more so than I, everything's financial. It's like everything, it's all about the money, but what about the people? So I don't know. I don't know how you would convince a politician of that. I really, I don't know much about politics, but. Mm. Well, you, you, maybe not the formal politics, but both of you have lived very uh, intricate lives with political decisions that were kind of made on your behalf. That's mm. true. And you're living with the consequences of some of it. But now you're at a point of getting to influence it. <laughs> 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 you want to play with that thought a bit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like her. I'm, I'm, not as or I'm not very politically driven, so I, yeah. but you do say clearly we've been steered by politics and that sort of thing. but almost like without my knowledge, I would say, in a lot yeah. of cases. So. Yeah, it, it influences us. Yeah. Um, and there's a real need for a new narrative in this province mm. or uh, the whole country with what politics yeah. is. So you say politics and you can see the cringe. It's like, yeah. both of yeah. you. It's like, Rrr. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> just next question. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but imagine if that was fun. Imagine if it was more like a large community discussion yeah. rather than mm. um, a power exercise or uh, influence exercise. Mm. Um, so with a new election coming, if I could slide into that, and you guys vote now, do you, do you uh, that's the wrong question about do you pay attention? You do pay attention in your own way, but what, what would you like to see out of that whole process? Definitely a more open narrative, if, if, if that's possible. I, I know when I first started to vote, when I was first given the option, I looked everywhere uh, at the time for just what each person I was voting for really represented and why they were different and there's not enough of that like if they could sit down and, and be really open about and be asked questions and I know they do but uh, on a level that I can participate and that's something that I, I think is missing maybe it's hmm. good I would just appreciate honesty <laughs> as we said before because there are always promises made and there are, their platform could be fantastic, but whether or not they can actually accomplish those things is another thing. So sometimes they'll, people will say things and it doesn't happen and then it gets discouraging for people who are voting because you think, well, maybe I should have voted for this other person and they could have gotten something done. But really, does it even matter in the end? No matter who is elected or whatever it may be, there are going to be people who are disappointed and there are going to be people who are happy. So. I don't know. I don't know how to deal with politics. <laughs> Maybe that's something that we need. Like our generation needs to be more educated on it because like I don't put a lot of energy of my life into that. Mm -hmm. I focus at other places. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting, and thank you for being so open about that because that is one of the big conundrums, how to get young people involved in the processes that really do affect their lives, from the amount of money you have to pay back and the interest rate you're paying on it mm -hmm. to what the government priorities were and why it was that way, like a free tuition model as opposed to we're going to get you early <laughs> yeah. and keep you in debt early model, you mm -hmm. know. Or the awakenings that are going on all around the world that you can find through social media on uh, student protest or public protest because they don't like the way it's been going anymore and they've had enough. So I don't know if you could ever imagine 20,000 people downtown Fredericton protesting <laughs> in front of the <laughs> ledge saying, we don't want to do it this way anymore. Yeah. But sometimes it feels like that. Maybe that'll be you guys. We'll look for you in the front of the crowd. <laughs> yeah, <one>. maybe. <laughs> I'll take it on. Yeah, true. Um, last thoughts. We should start to wrap up a little bit. This has been great. We've wandered all over the place. Um, but do you have, is there something we didn't touch on that you thought would have been a fun thing to talk about? Uh, is there a question that should have framed better so that you had another answer instead of <laughs> where it went, you know? Cause I've answered fairly well. I, I can't think of anything that I'm, I, we didn't touch on that we talked about. I have to think. Because <laughs> yeah. I know like before, we've talked about it before and I, it, I need to get into that place where I'm just like, ah, so like the student loan debt is the thing that really like. It hangs, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And, and that's, that's a big thing for me because I have so much of it. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. And it hangs for a lot of people. It was through your Facebook group. It was constant. Mm -hmm. So for tw from 25 to 35 years of age, your choices become limited because from 18 to 25, you incurred this responsibility that no one really taught you it's going to impact you this much. Yes. <laughs> it was never, ex well, maybe my mom tried to explain it to me at one point, but yeah. I don't know. I didn't realize to what extent it would be, would affect my life after graduation. Yeah. And then related to that, now that you're out, which is the fun of this conversation, is the work world has now arrived and the work world is intermittent to the best. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you carry that responsibility and still have fun with your life and explore things, quality of life issues? And, and find work that gets that created. And it might be you guys really do have to create your own. Yeah. It might, I don't know what it looks like like you, but maybe those ideas come from gathering with lots of other people in the same boat and say, you know, we're going to go do it this way. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Yeah. Closing comments? No? Was it fun? Was it okay? Mm -hmm. Thanks for having us on. Yeah. First time on TV? Ah, well, sort of. You have a <laughs> vlog yeah. and, and you do things on the internet the other way. So. So that's it for the interview. Um, big thanks to Robert McLaughlin and Jimmy Lee Hahn for coming as our guests as recent graduates from university and entering this other phase in their lives. Um, as always, be good, have fun, and love each other. Bye.